Hi everyone, this podcast with Melissa Crouch was recorded just hours before the committee representing the Pyeong Su Lutdo declared the 2008 constitution void and presented its federal democracy charter. So, while we do discuss the possibility of such an interim charter and the issues connected to it, uh, we don't go into any actual details about the contents of the charter, which were at that time still unknown. Um, Needless to say though, this declaration and charter is really politically significant, so consider this podcast as an excellent entree to that development. And without further ado... Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's March 31, 2021, and today we are speaking with Professor Melissa Crouch, Professor in the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales, about the political events in Myanmar since February 1, mostly, through the prism of the country's 2008 constitution, its drafting and its potential reform or abolishment and future. Hello, Melissa. Hi, Luke. Thanks for having me. My absolute pleasure. Now, you have been writing regularly on the constitutionality of the military coup that took place on February 1 and related issues. But let's begin really simply. A lot of us think we know what a nation's constitution is, sort of intuitively. It's laws determining, you know, fundamental principles of governments. But Even in fortunate, wealthy, democratic nations with high standards of education, I think misunderstanding still exists. So could you quickly tell us what is a nation's constitution and what do people often confuse or misapprehend about them and what they do? Hmm. That's a great way to start because I think even in surveys that have been done in Australia, there's actually a very low level of um, understanding that there is a constitution in Australia. So um, look, a constitution in the way that scholars uh, like to talk about it is sometimes understood as a power map um, by which they mean a way of distributing power amongst different institutions and agencies and so that kind of everybody knows who has power for what um, and where accountability lies. Um, Another way of thinking about constitutions, I guess, is as a limit on power. So the idea that the state is a very powerful body and that people need protection from the state and that there needs to be lines of accountability and um, transparency and checks and balances on different power. So a constitution is a way of setting out those checks and balances. I think in liberal democratic societies in particular, that's usually the way we understand constitutions is they're not just about giving power to different institutions, but they really do help to act as a check and balance and in particular as a protection for individual um, rights. And in 2019, you wrote a book particularly about the constitution in Myanmar. It's called The Constitution of Myanmar, A Contextual Analysis. And before we come to, you know, the recent events, let's talk about the background and all the work you did for this book, which was before the recent coup. Um, In the book, you say Myanmar's 2008 constitution is, quote, a patchwork of ideas from three main sources. One was the 1947 constitution, two was the 1974 constitution, and three was military propaganda and ideas that developed in the 1990s. So how did the 2008 constitution even come about, given there'd already been other constitutions in the past. Yeah, so you're right that Myanmar is one country that has had multiple constitutions since independence from colonial rule, and actually that's quite common in many countries around the world. I think the key point to appreciate about that is that the past constitutions were actually rooted in or had their origins in particular legal traditions, if you like. So the 1947 constitution, the first post-independence constitution, was really quite similar to India. It was uh, based on more of a a parliamentary uh, democracy, but also more of a 
a, a social democracy. So, you know, the idea that resources were supposed to be distributed for the benefit of the broader people. And that was really in reaction to colonial rule. Um, I think it was in reaction to the excessive powers of the executive under colonial rule, as well as the biases and, you know, inherent racism in the colonial system that really privileged British colonizers and those who worked for the British um, as opposed to local people. The 74 constitution um, really comes from socialist ideas of legality and borrowed from, um, you know, places like the USSR at the time. As a constitution, it um, downplayed the role of the courts and it placed a lot of power in a centralised uh, executive. You know, there wasn't really uh, elections in the sense of competitive elections. Um, and it was a highly unified and centralised system, but also one that while it did recognise minority groups, it did so in a way that um, select sort of minority groups were all treated equal. So there wasn't a sense that you could perhaps treat one group different to others, um, but they sort of were all treated the same, if you like. So, uh, for example, um, this is where the idea of the seven um, divisions come from, uh, seven states, sorry, um, in contrast to the seven divisions. So the states being based on different ethnic recognition of different ethnic groups um, in relation to a particular territorial area. When we come to the 2008 constitution, it is a difficult one to understand because it's not, it doesn't have its origins in one particular legal tradition. Um, I, as I say, it borrows, some of it has some resonance with the 1940s constitution, some of it um, has resonance with the socialist constitution, and here I'm thinking of um, particularly the emphasis on duties of citizens to the state. And that emphasis on duties over rights is really uh, quite a socialist way of thinking about things. So it sort of it inverts the normal assumptions that are embedded in a constitution. So normally, you know, you presume that the state is all powerful and a constitution is to protect individuals from the state or from abuses by the state, whereas socialist constitutions kind of switched that around and they said citizens are responsible for helping the state and for, you know, for achieving state objectives. Citizens have duties. But the problem with that is that it can lead to um, serious abuses of individual rights um, because these duties can be understood very widely and misused against citizens, really. So those kinds of things are in the 2008 constitution. But then, of course, you have a real mix of um, some of the military propaganda from the 1990s. And I guess that real emphasis on the role of the military in the political and governance system uh, is, of course, entrenched in the 2008 constitution. And how was the 2008 constitution adopted? From the 1990s, uh, there was an election where obviously the NLD was not allowed to take office. What the military did is it said, we will um, instead form a um, assembly to draft a constitution. Um, I've referred to this in other places as a kind of preemptive form of constitution making. So the idea that the military was preempting a democratic system. So they were trying to um, avoid some of the ideas perhaps that the NLD might have um, put in place if they had been allowed to take office um, and instead drafted a constitution that had the military in mind and that had the military as a primary um, institution in the political system. So that drafting process, you know, took a very long time. Um, it There was a period where it stopped and started and it was not until 2008, just after Cyclone Nargis, when there was a national referendum. Um, of course, that was all a bit for show because many people had been very seriously affected by the cyclone, particularly in parts of lower Myanmar. And of course, many others had simply never had the chance to read the constitution um, and, and certainly didn't have a role in participating in um, what it actually said. So um, while there was uh, the semblance of a, of a referendum, you know, the outcome was questionable, but of course it was endorsed. The military claimed that it was endorsed and then um, really this framework came into operation in 2011. And the context for the 2008 drafting and adoption was very much to do with 
democracy, right? This was kind of an overriding language. The way that organs of government were set up was supposed to be more democratic than what came before. Is that right? Um, look, I think the way I would put it is it was it was a return to a multi-party system, and that's often the words that the military uses. So this is, I mean, under uh, socialist rule, the only one um, the socialist party was was allowed. Uh, so this was the idea that they the military was allowing a return to multi-party rules, so allowing political parties to gain for the first time, allowing them to compete in the elections. But, you know, the, the extent to which it was democratic, you know, there, there were certainly uh, significant limitations on that. And obviously things like the 25% of military seats in the parliament that are unelected um, is a significant compromise in any democratic system. Okay, now that we know all of that, can we say that the 2008 constitution was considered or still is considered to be legitimate and by who? Mm. So prior to the coup, I would say that the constitution still had a major um, legitimacy problem and really for two reasons. One is that the process, you know, was uh, controlled by the military. It was seen as um, exclusive. There certainly wasn't any attempt for broader democratic or public participation, but just the fact as well that it was in the context of the NLD not being able to take office. So again, the context of elected representatives not being able to take office, you know, signaled that this was an undemocratic process. Um, so I think the process is important. And obviously, again, Cyclone Nargis, um, the very fact that the referendum was still held, despite the fact that many people were paced facing significant personal tragedy, um, you know, does undermine its the pr credibility of that process. But I think also many people from different um, groups and backgrounds and sectors had concerns about the substance of the constitution. Um, obviously, for many groups from ethnic minority backgrounds, um, they didn't see this as introducing a federal system, and you know that has been an ongoing aspiration for them. Um, you know, for others, it was more concerns about how democratic or undemocratic this system was, and they, um, you know, many people would disagree with the fact that the military has such a prominent role and that the military, you know, has unelected seats in parliament. Um, so for many reasons, I think both to do with the process of drafting it as well as the substance, it didn't actually have that legitimacy to begin with. Having said that, of course, um, you know, most groups did choose to work within the political system, particularly from 2012 when the NLD uh, entered the by-election and was successful there. Post the coup, um, I think, you know, the 2008 constitution is in much more doubt now even than it was in the past. And really, I think the perception on the ground in Myanmar is that the military has betrayed the, the legal framework that it chose to introduce and that people tried to work within. And of course, we're seeing, you know, protesters from different um, backgrounds uh, calling for the abolition of the 2008 constitution and calling for a new uh, political settlement and one that is uh, more based on uh, federalism and democracy. Yeah. And before we um, just thinking about what happened on February 1, uh, what role did the constitution play, you know, in the recent events leading up to that um, for many surprising development. Mm. Yeah, so you're right that there was a lot of discussion and debate about um, the constitution. Obviously, the, from the military's perspective, since the November 2020 elections, um, they, ha they have raised allegations about electoral fraud. But the military did do this in ways that attempted to use the existing legal framework um, to raise those concerns. So, for example, they went to the Union Election Commission um, and lodged complaints there. They tried to, uh, th they submitted a petition to the Speaker and President to call for a special session of the Pidang Suluto, or the Parliament, to ask the um, legislature to uh, discuss uh, and resolve this issue of electoral fraud and um, that was declined because the NLD felt that the most appropriate forum for the resolution of such allegations is the Union Election Commission, which is probably true under the Constitution. 
Um, and then there was also attempts to by the military to bring a court case in the Supreme Court um, under a constitutional provision that allows for a remedy where um, there are concerns that a person who has taken office, so for example in elections, is not actually legally qualified or doesn't meet the requirements to hold that office. Um, again, that was all in the rush just before 1 February, but I think it became increasingly clear to the military that these various um, legal mechanisms to try and resolve disputes that are inbuilt into the uh, 2008 constitution and the system it introduces weren't going to be enough for what the military wanted to achieve. And so, of course, we saw um, that they took power by force on the 1st of February. Okay, and a question that you must be familiar with by now and many legal experts of Myanmar must be familiar with is, uh, in your view, did the military follow the constitution when it detained the elected leaders and took power by force on February 1? So the military's line at the moment is that it has, it claims it is following the procedures on a constitutional state of emergency. Um, but I think for many reasons, um, that's not a valid claim. Look, there are many points along the way at which you could say the military hasn't followed the proper process. Um, for example, the president um, in the constitution is clearly designated as the most important person in Myanmar. Uh, and legal proceedings aren't able to be brought against the president. The only sort of form of proceedings you can bring against a president is impeachment proceedings. Um, and look, this is the case in some other countries where basically it's trying to avoid a situation of the political opposition trying to undermine, you know, the office of the president in some way and making sure that there is a, a clear um, but specific process for dealing with any complaints against the president. Um, so arguably the military, you know, didn't have the power to detain the president because it's clear that what if they did have concerns about him or his role, that it should have been dealt with via impeachment proceedings. Um, in addition, you know, the military's claim that their request to hold a special session of the Pinang Suluto was denied. Um, you know, the military says, well, that's a reason for a coup. I don't think that's sufficient. That's not really an emergency in the sense in which the constitution understands it. So if you look at the constitution, it says things like um, if there is, you know, an, an armed uh, uprising or violence or, you know, I mean, emergency is supposed to be a very serious situation um, that requires, that has a sense of urgency, that requires an immediate response. Um, so I think there's a question as to whether there was, you know, a sufficient emergency to allow uh, emergency powers to be used. Um, because the military then took the president out of action by arresting him, they claim that the vice president, uh, Min Tsui, who was appointed by the military, uh, had the power to exercise a, a state of emergency. Um, again, I think there's questions as to whether he is capable of holding office, wh whether he meets the criteria. Um, so I've written a short piece that demonstrates it is understood that he has a son-in-law who possibly has Australian citizenship. If that is true, that would mean Mintzway is actually not even eligible to hold the office of vice president or president because just like Aung, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, he would fail on that same requirement. That's never been proven or disproven. I think Australia could play a role in clarifying that situation because obviously they have records as to who is an Australian citizen and who has renounced their citizenship. But the military has certainly never offered any evidence to show that the son-in-law of Mintzway um, has renounced his Australian citizenship, which to me would be the necessary proof you would need to show that Mintzway is actually eligible to be president or vice president. So we come to a situation now where the military is obviously claiming to act under the constitutional state of emergency powers that empower the commander in chief to exercise all legislative, executive and judicial power or to delegate or distribute that as is needed. Um, but I think uh, the point uh, here is that the necessary steps in the process to get to that stage haven't been followed. Um, and there are many holes in the arguments that the military is um, raising as to why 
it thinks this is necessary. So look, I think this is a fairly important point because at the moment, the CRPH, the Committee of Representatives for the Pirang Suluto, are seeking recognition from the international community and particularly from the UN, that they are the legitimate body to govern Myanmar as the elected representatives from the 2020 elections. Um, and so this is a big issue that I think will influence the direction um, going forward of this coup, because if the international community was instead to recognise the military and to recognise the SAC, the body that the military has set up, that would be really a significant setback for those who oppose the coup um, and would make it really difficult going forward for the CRPH and their efforts to try and ensure a return to civilian rule, but also to try and forge a new political settlement for the future of the country. Does this mean we're at the point where if the UN and other international actors recognise the CRPH and their new national unity government, that will be equated with a new constitution for Myanmar in the future? I think you're right that the CRPH and this idea of a national unity government, uh, they would like to head in that direction. So I certainly think that we will see at some point um, you know, announcements from them around some sort of interim agreement um, that would potentially lead to a future constitution. Um, obviously, there's challenges in uh, realising that. And I think that we're still at a preliminary stage at the moment of waiting to see how the international community, but also just how individual governments, how the US, how Australia, how others, whether they are going to individually recognise um, the CRPH is a, a big question. I think the look, if the CRPH was to uh, introduce any sort of interim constitution, um, I think there's recognition that, you know, that it would be an interim agreement that there would need to be, you know, further discussion and um, a, a more open process to drafting some sort of more permanent agreement. But the big challenge is you know, whether or how you involve the military in that in the future. Obviously, the appetite at the moment in Myanmar is not to engage with the military at all, and for obvious reasons, right? They're using force, they're using violence. It's arbitrary um, and uh, devastating, and, you know, for that reason, people do not think it's appropriate, I guess, to revert to a system where the military was a kind of a third party, a leading party in the peace discussions and negotiations over the future. So um, I think the international community may potentially play a role in the future in that um, because it's difficult to see at this stage um, a return to a system that operates under the 2008 constitution because I think that um, is now, you know, looking very unlikely. So if we accept that the coup of February 1st has significant problems regarding its constitutionality and that there seems to be this irony that the military doesn't like how its constitution works. Can we see what has happened as a kind of failure of process given the military created this constitution? Yeah, so I think it is in part a failure of process or a failure of, you know, the military doesn't see itself as being bound by the same rules that everybody else is. So I think what this whole situation does is it exposes some of the flaws in the existing 2008 agreement, which is that the military was designed as a kind of fourth branch of government, almost as an independent and unaccountable branch and one that played a significant kind of supervision watchdog role, if you like, over the civilian system. Um, and that would at times call out civilian actors when it didn't like what they were doing and tried to, in informal ways and sort of through intimidation and threats, would put limits on what civilian actors could do. So I think that's a fundamental flaw in the 2008 Constitution. I think the coup you know, reminds the international community that we're dealing with an institution um, that perhaps in the end is not interested in any form of transition to complete civilian rule. You know, this the coup reinforces the role of the military in national politics. Um, and that's, uh, you know, difficult 
well, one, it's obviously difficult for pro-democratic actors in Myanmar to accept because, you know, they were obviously hoping that at some stage there would be a more of a transition and to complete civilian rule. Um, and I think the coup is a reminder that, you know, I think that's a distant possibility and um, we're dealing now with a military that sees a fundamental role for itself in the political system and that inevitably limits the nature of democracy or simply the nature of the multi-party system that the military had envisioned. In recent weeks, we've seen the introduction of martial law in certain areas of the country, and that has gone hand in hand with a real increase in atrocities, murder of civilians, and the kinds of weapons that are being used on the public. So is this martial law and this increased violence connected to a function of the constitution? So you're right that the declaration of martial law in some parts of um, Yangon and Mandalay, I think, is a very serious escalation of the crisis. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind in in other countries, the concept of martial law is sometimes simply used interchangeably with the idea of a state of emergency. So basically, you know, in, in many countries around the world, martial law is sort of normalised as a state of emergency, it's constitutional. But I think the thing to note is that usually there are still checks and balances um, on a state of emergency or martial law. So, for example, um, the courts might play a role in deciding on the validity of the declaration of a state of emergency or the validity, the constitutionality of um, a declaration of martial law. Um, so the important thing to note about Myanmar is that none of those checks and balances are in place. And I think really martial law in Myanmar has come to be a bit of an excuse um, for the military to simply take complete control in a particular area uh, to sideline civilian administrators and judges and to impose, um, you know, to give military commanders and officers com complete control in that area. So I think the real concern is that um, this has, there is no oversight of what the military is doing um, in these areas. Uh, and, you know, I think down the track, that's going to be one of the key issues is that how do you get an institution that has largely acted, you know, with impunity and no accountability for decades um, to realise that if you have a constitutional system, all actors should be subject to some of the limits of that um, constitution. And I think that includes the military. And in a, a more liberal democratic conception of martial law, there would still be limits on what the military could do in that situation. Unfortunately, I think in Myanmar, um, it, it very much allows the military to do what it likes. And I think that poses grave concerns for people who have chosen to remain in those areas, though, of course, this has led to a mass exodus for many people, um, sort of migrant workers who have um, left here and gone now and gone back to their hometowns. Mm. Okay, this has been a really interesting and lively discussion about the Constitution and the role that it's playing in the really sad events that are still taking place in the wonderful place that is Myanmar. Um, before we finish up, it's tradition to ask our guests for a recommendation. Um, it can be anything you like to do with Myanmar. So before we head off, Melissa, was there anything you would like to recommend to our listeners? Oh, look, just given the coup and the fact that perhaps many listeners may be wanting to be kept up to date on what's going on, I think it's useful to be reading and paying attention to what um, people from Myanmar are writing about this, and I'm thinking particularly of journalists. Um, obviously, we're in a very serious situation now where many journalists themselves have been targeted, have been arrested, um, and some have, you know, already fled the country. But there are obviously um, English language outlets like Myanmar Now is a great one, um, Frontier, um, and then there are still some existing ones like um, Mizima and others uh, that are continuing to report on the situation and that often um, include the voices of people from Myanmar and their experiences of what are happening now. So I think I just put that in the mix. Yep, sensational. And um, they have websites and they also have Twitter handles under those names. 
Okay, well, thank you so much for coming back to Myanmar Musings, Melissa. I didn't didn't mention that we do have another episode on a previous edited volume of yours called Islam and the State in Myanmar, if anyone wants to go back and listen to that from 2017. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Luke.